we started uh, last week a Force Women series on God's Mount Rushmore. And last week we talked about Abraham as being the first person that God, I believe, would put on his Mount Rushmore, the four uh, pillars of God's faith or the faith that, that we follow from the Holy Bible. And we talked about, about uh, Abraham last week. We found out that he was a man that even though he didn't exactly hear from God where to go, he took off. He just believed and he went. We talked about him not being a perfect man. That he got to a point that he was discouraged. God had to tell him to lift his head up. And we even talked about him being a patient man. And the New Testament credits him as being a man of faith because when he did not know this foreign land, he went to where God sent him. Today, I want to cover the second person that I think would be on God's Mount Rushmore, the four pillars of the faith. And uh, there was some discussion this week about who should go on there, who should not go on there. I'm not going to put Daniel or Mario on there. Um, they want to be on God's Mount Rushmore, but we're not going to put them on there. But we are going to put Abraham and now Moses. Moses. Moses on God's Mount Rushmore. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 29, the Word of God says that by faith Moses' parents hid him from, for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's eating. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He preserved because he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Just like Abraham, Moses is credited in the New Testament as being a man of faith. In fact, it is Moses and Abraham that stand guard in the Holy of Holies in Revelation. I believe if you are going to have a Mount Rushmore, the Holy Bible, you must have Moses in it. Not just because the Ten Commandments was the best Bible story ever made. Not just because I love the Prince of Egypt, but because Moses was a man of faith. Now I want to present to you Moses. A man with flaws, a man with errors, a man with disabilities, a man with anger issues, a man who had all sorts of mistakes in his past, but even then, God would use him to do great and wonderful things. He started off as a fugitive because he had broken the law and murdered a man, but he ended up on God's Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. And he was so close to God that God said, I speak to people in parables. I speak to people and sometimes they hear my voice. But when I speak to Moses, I speak to him face to face as a man speaks to a man. How could you not include him on God's Mount Rushmore? But he was flawed. Number one, he was an insecure man. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. That whole chapter 3 is God calling Moses to serve him. God saying to him, I want you to follow me. Because even though he was a murderer, God could still use him. Even though he was running from the law, God could still use him. Even though he grew up on the wrong side of the track, God could still use him. So God appeared to him in a burning bush when Moses was hiding out in the desert. The Bible says he was on the back side of the desert. That means he had hit the lowest of lows. He had gone down as far as you could go down. When he reached that point, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And he said to him, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But Moses said to God in Exodus 3.11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll tell you who you are. You're the person I picked. You're the one that I've chosen to send. So in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, when God tells him, it doesn't matter that you think you're lonely. I'm sending you, and you're going to go and tell the people. God said, let my people go. In chapter 4, the very next chapter, verse 1, 
Moses answered, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? What if they say the Lord didn't appear to you? First of all, he says, I'm not good enough to go. Then he says, what if people don't believe what I have to say? Verse 10 of chapter 4. Verse 10, God says, look, quit making excuses. You're going to go in verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, oh Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since. You have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and of tongue. God says, look, you're going. Whether you want to or not, I will use you, and you will do great things in my name. In verse 13, Moses said, but God, oh Lord, send someone else. I got a feeling there's people in this church this morning who feel like they're not adequate enough to follow God. I got a feeling there are people here this morning who say, I don't have the abilities to teach or to preach or to tell people of God. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning that says, Pastor, I have this issue in my past. I'm not, who am I to go and to serve God? I want to tell you this morning, you can be like Moses and have a small image of yourself, but if God's going to use you, there's nothing you can do about it. God will use words if he has to, and he'll use you. God, I don't want to go. Send someone else. Moses was aware of his weaknesses. He was aware of his faults, and he thought they disqualified him from serving God. I want to tell you this morning, none of you are wanted for murder, I hope. None of you are being looked for by the police, I hope. None of you have hit rock bottom on the backside of the desert, but don't wait to get there. If God is calling you, answer him now. Don't wait till you're on the backside of the desert. Don't wait till you have nowhere else to turn. He tells God, send it someone else. God told him, you see, your brother Aaron, he's already on his way here. He's coming and you're going to go back and you're going to tell them, let my people go. So if you sit here this morning and you say, I can't teach, I can't serve, I can't volunteer, I want you to know God's already working on you and you don't have a choice. God's going to use you one way or the other. Low self-esteem. I think, I think that, that men especially, we have too much high self-esteem. How, how many of you men think you're all that? Say amen. See? Three or four of them said amen. One in the back and one like this. You guys missed it. Amen. Men have high self-esteem and I think that's a good thing. And that's why God's given us wives. So that they can bring our self-esteem down. How many men can say amen? There's two of us. The other ones are cowards. They won't admit it. But he, he had a low self-esteem. And I want to tell you something this morning. It's good to be humble. It's good to be humble. We should all be humble. Man, we should be more humble. But don't get to the point where you think lowly of yourself, to the point where you're crippled and God can't use you. If you're sitting here this morning and you say, Pastor, I have, I have so many issues, God can't use me. Well, guess what? Welcome to the party. You're in a church full of people with a bad past. I mean, look at the person sitting next to you. Look to your left, look to your right. You know they have skeletons in their closet. You know they got stories in the past. You know what they did last summer, but God still loves them and can still use them so he can use you. He can use you. Perhaps you have issues. Perhaps you're like pastor. You have all sorts of issues. I got enough issues for me and two people that want to join me. I guess what? If I was perfect, then I'd be useless to God. If I was perfect, I'd be useless to God because then I'd be too good for nothing. You ever heard somebody go good for nothing? I think there's some people that are too good for nothing. They can't get out of their own way for God to use them. Don't stop yourself because of your issues, your weaknesses, even your disabilities. Some of you may be disabled. Some of you might have been diagnosed as a young person with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, right? Maybe you just have the, the first one, which is attention deficit disorder. So you can be sitting here in your ADD. At this church, you fit right in, by the way. You could be HD, you could have all these issues. And you could say, I'm disabled. Well, guess what? God is looking for some people who got a little bit of issues like that, who know I need God. Let me tell you, let me say that again. God would rather have somebody with ADD and ADHD that 
knows they need God. There's somebody who says, I got it all together, and I really can do this without, with or without God. If you got issues, welcome to the party. If you got a past, welcome to truth. If you got disabilities, get in line with the rest of us. Last night, it was about 6, 30, 7 o'clock. It was already getting dark outside. And I was flipping through the channels, and I saw something that said, Clovis, Clovis Mansion Haunted or something. It was on a &E or Discovery Channel. So I started watching it. Because it was Clovis, California. I guess there's this haunted house on, on, uh, on Clovis Avenue just past the house, Ashton or Gettysburg. Then it's a really haunted house. But I'm watching this, and I'm sitting there watching this, and then as, as it started getting scary. I mean, it really it started getting scary. And I was like, watching this, and I was like, my wife says I'm always letting all these spirits into the house. Maybe she's right. So I'm watching this. And I chased it because I got scared, so I chased the channel. And I know God is not giving us a spirit of fear, amen? But that channel gave me a spirit of fear. It wasn't God. So as I'm watching this, then all of a sudden I have to go to the bathroom. But you never got to go to the bathroom until you're all alone and scared in the house is dark at 6 o'clock. So I called Chico, Chico! Because I heard the dogs can like pick up on spirits. People, it's 6 o'clock, right? I'm terrified. It's dark outside. So I call Chico. Chico, come here. You want to go outside? So he goes to the door. I go, no, let's go to the other door. Go to the other side of the house. And, I, and, and the dog follows me. And I turn on all the lights. And I know where all the lights are. And I'm laughing because I'm going. I'm scared, but I'm laughing because I'm always yelling at the kids. Why do you need the lights on? And there I go to the bathroom with the dog. Guess what? I have issues. But God can still use this little man with issues. And God can use you. God can use you. God can use you. Don't disqualify yourself because of your issues. So number one, Moses is an insecure man with issues. Number two, Numbers chapter 11, verse 4 through 15. As they're walking through the desert, God is providing for them manna from heaven. He's given them manna from heaven. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 15, the people kind of get tired of what God's provided them. So these people that he's leading through the desert are not too happy with the food God's provided them. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4 to 15, you can follow along, or you can just listen to the story. The rabble with them began to crave other food. Somebody say rabble this morning. Rabble. How many of you are sick and tired of the rabble? I mean, you don't even know what the rabble is. The rabble are the people that are always complaining. How many of you know people that are always complaining say amen? Now you know what to call them. The rabble. Next time somebody starts complaining, say, look, rabble. They wanted to create other food, but God gave them was not enough. In fact, the next time the kids complain about what you've cooked for them, tell them this is what God has provided. Don't be like the rabble. Amen? I guess my wife's the only one that has a problem feeding the kids. Oh, they'll eat cornflakes. Cornflakes. You don't even know what cornflakes are. They'll eat, they'll eat, they'll eat, they'll eat cornflakes. They'll eat Cheerios. They'll eat, they'll eat cereal all day. Let her put some, something nutritious in front of them, and all of a sudden, the rabble doesn't want them get what God has given them. My kids are smart. They'll go grab a box of cereal and say, thank you, Lord, for what you provide. And again, the Israelites started wailing. That's another word for whining. Oh, don't you just love those people that are always whining? They said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. No cost. Really? No cost? You were slaves. Oh, pastor. I remember the other church. It was smaller. It was so easy to clean. It was so much better. But if you want to go back, they're still open. It's called the Rock Go. Also, we ate cucumbers. 
the people went around gathering it and then it, it gathered it from the ground in a handmill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. So this is this is what God has provided in the temple. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry. Somebody said, God gets angry. Tell the person next to you, don't make God mad. And Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have all these, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them on my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land they promised and owed to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. They're to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all of these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. Not only does he have issues, he's suicidal. God, I can't handle these kids anymore. Take my life. God, I can't handle this spouse anymore. Take his life. Moses says, I can't carry their burdens. It's too heavy for me. Before he got to the point of wanting to die, he even blamed God for their shortcoming. He said, why have you brought this trouble on me? Isn't it interesting when people start to blame God for other people's issues? God, why did you allow me to marry this woman? God, why did you bring this man into my life? God, why did you let me take this job? God, why did you let us buy this house? Why did you let me get into that? God, 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 God. It ain't God, it's you. Quit blaming God for all your problems that you put out on yourself by getting yourself into debt and into situationships and relationships. I know that's not a word, situationships, but you understood. And that's what's bad is you're understanding. Don't blame God for the relationships and the situations you got yourself into. It ain't God's fault, Moses. I mean, people. Let me just pause right here to say something. If you have any thoughts of hurting yourself or somebody else, please talk to someone. Talk to me. If you have any thoughts of hurting somebody else or hurting yourself, please talk to me. I usually say, talk to Pastor Daniel, Pastor Mario, Pastor Ivan. I'm telling you this morning, talk to me. Because I know what it's like to want to kill somebody. I know what it's like to rather be dead than alive. Jokingly, we say words like, please God, come now. I'm done. Yesterday, my wife took the kids back to school shopping. I got on my motorcycle. I'm looking for a horse trainer. So I went out to the country, up Highway 41, all the way to, to the moor, and I came across, and I came back over here to Kingsbury and other places. As I was driving around out there, I started getting hot, I started going home. I got home and I texted my wife and I said, uh, I'm home now. What she doesn't know is that I deleted the rest of the text. I said on the rest of the text, I'm sorry I didn't die. Now, you guys, I don't want you to think I'm suicidal. I need to talk to somebody. I got other issues. Suicide is not one of them right now. <laughs> but I erased it. I erased it. But I actually, I actually text that. You know, you got issues if you text stuff like that. But I got a feeling some of you have some issues too. So pointing the finger at me because you're pointing green back at yourself. But even jokingly, we should be careful what we say. Every life is precious. That's why I don't know if I believe in capital punishment anymore, because I believe God will give her a life. Moses says, I can't handle these burdens anymore. Start projecting unto God. But what's interesting for me here is that Moses is saying to God, I am sick of these people's problems. I can't handle these people's problems. They're a burden. I need to get them off my back. I feel like I'm carrying them. Guess what? I'll give you permission this morning to get rid of all the losers in your life. If there are people bringing you down because of their problems, you need to cut them off right now. Now, don't go home and apply for a divorce and say, Pastor told me to get rid of my problem. 
I got that call before. I don't want to get that call again. My wife knows I got that call. Man called me and said, thanks, Pastor, my wife leaving me. She said you told her to leave me. You told her to leave me. But I have never told anybody to divorce anybody. I've never said it. I don't know. I never really was. But she said that you said it. Call the sister, sister. You're the one that said to cut, cut the loose package in my life. And I want to tell you this morning, quit running yourself into the ground, carrying everybody else's problems. The Bible says every day has enough problems of its own. That means that you personally shouldn't even carry your own problems. You shouldn't even be carrying your own problems, much less somebody else's. And guess what? There's a bunch of people in this world who will just come and throw their problems all over you. They'll just walk right up to you and blah. Here's my problem. You can be sitting here in church, minding your own business, talking to a brother, and you're sitting there talking with the brother, and it's all good. You're talking about the, the game yesterday. You're talking about the Raiders getting beat down by the Cowboys last week. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there, and you're talking about these things, and don't think I forgot. And you're sitting there, and you're talking about these things. And all of a sudden, here comes brother problem all the time. And here comes brother problem all the time. You're sitting here having a good, healthy discussion with brother problem all the time. Because they're like, oh, my God, it's miserable. I sometimes want to say, don't you see us talking? Don't you see we're having fellowship? And here comes brother problems all the time. And if it isn't his wife, if it's kids. If it isn't his kids, the dog ran away. And if the dog didn't run away, the car has a flat tire. Always, 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 always. It gets to the point where you need to tell brother problems all the time. You need to go to the altar and just repent and tell God, I have too many problems in my life. Something must be wrong with me. You weren't meant to carry everybody's problem. If Moses teaches us something, is what? Don't carry everybody's burdens on your shoulders. You got enough of your own. You got enough on your own. If you carry everyone's problems around, they will overwhelm you. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. Jesus speaking said these words, Come to me, all of you who are tired and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He says, I will give you Prozac. He says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Cast your burden upon Jesus. Some of you don't listen to this. But there's some of you who are the problem person. And I want to tell you something this morning. You need to learn to cast your problems on Jesus. It's one thing to ask somebody to pray with you. It's another thing to keep being a burden on those people. And I'm going to tell you something. The rabble always exaggerates. The rabble always makes the problems worse than it is. They're sitting there saying, oh, in Egypt we had this at no cost. We used to sit around eating cucumbers and melons all day. And they start to exaggerate their problems. That's what those people do. Don't get caught in that cycle of problematic people. It's one thing to say, I'm going to pray for you. Check up on them. How are you doing? It's another thing when you start paying their bills. You can't say amen, say oh, no. So number one, he has low self-esteem. He has too many issues. Number two, he gets suicidal. And number three, Moses' biggest problem of all that caused him the biggest issue was anger. How many know somebody who has anger issues, say amen? How many of you are the person with anger issues, say amen? You're in denial. Because at least four of you should have said amen. How many of you guys are married to somebody with anger issues? Say amen. They're like, he's too angry. I can't say that thing. <laughs> they set their mind. They say, glory, hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Son. But outside, they're like, they don't know this. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 19, Moses is coming off the mountain where he received the Ten Commandments. Moses in his hand has two tablets made of stone that God himself wrote on people. That's you. It's one thing to have a letter that pastor wrote. It's another thing to have a tablet of stone written in God's hand ready. He has it in his hand. He's coming down the mountain when he hears dancing and partying and all sorts of craziness. And he gets to the point where he reaches the bottom of the mountain and he says, what is going on here? When Moses approached the camp and he saw the cow and the dancing, his anger burned. His anger burned. And he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. You know you've got to be angry to be 
to a bag. That's what it is. It's the word of God. How mad you got to be to throw this at somebody? He threw it on the ground. By the way, if you throw the Bible, I think you could go to hell for 20 years. Don't do it. I will not put mine on the ground, much less throw it. Moses was angry. So he has a, we know that. Remember in Egypt, he got angry when that guy who was beaten up on the Israel, Israelite person. Moses killed him with his bare hands. So we know Moses has some issues. Maybe some anger issues. Moses, again, has another opportunity. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 1 through 12. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. He has another little anger issue or anger management out of control opportunity here. The people, again, are whining. And they're whining because they haven't found any water. Now, this is the second time they come to God whining about the water. The first time, God told Moses, you see the rock, Moses? And he said, yes, I see the rock. He says, tell the rock. No, the first time he told him, hit that rock, and they will get water. Moses told the people, this is so you know that God is real. He hit the rock, and water came out. This is the second time. Not the first time, when he was told by God, the rock. This is the second time. The first month of the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of sin, and they stayed at Kadesh 3. There, Miriam died and was buried. Now, there was no water for the community. And the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the large community into the desert that we are now and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, great mines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell face down in the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So this is what's happening. There's a problem in the people of God. Moses and Aaron go to the house of God to hear from God. So the people know they're going to go get a word from God. So they go to get their word from God. The Lord said to Moses, verse 7, verse 8, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock to the community so that their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff of the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebel! Must we bring you water out of this rock? And Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out. In the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you, not, you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I have promised them. Now I think that's heavy handed on God's part. Why is God so hard on Moses? The first time they ran out of water, God told them, not because I was angry. He said, grab that staff and hit the rock. Bam, water came out. The second time, God told him, speak to the rock. Moses, in his anger, chastised the people and said, you rebels! The words he used is, you rebel, must we bring you water out of this rock? God told him, speak to the rock. But he hit it twice. Now, I've always thought God was harsh, but then as I started studying, reading some commentaries and trying to understand Moses, getting him, him down on the couch and asking him what's wrong with him, I found something else. God didn't tell him to hit the rock. God didn't tell him to say anything. And I want to tell you something this morning. If God gives you an encouraging word for somebody or a word for somebody, be careful not to put in your two cents for God. God didn't tell Moses, judge the people. Who are you to judge the people? Who are we? Let me take that back. Who are we to judge the people? Are these people crazy? Yes. Are they worthy? Yes. Are they out of line? Yes. But God didn't tell Moses, put them in their place. God didn't tell Moses, lock their heels. God didn't tell Moses, straighten them out. God said, go and give them water so they will know that I'm holy. Moses goes and tells them off. And his anger strikes the rock two times, and it cost him. He never saw the promised land. What is your anger costing you? Things said in anger can never be taken back. You 
can apologize. But the words were out there flapping around like a fish. You tell a kid, you no good for nothing! You can say, I'm sorry. But they already heard the word, no good for nothing. My wife constantly reminds me. She goes, you once preached this, that for every insult you give your spouse, it takes 10. 10 compliments to make up for. In your anger, you say things you wish you, you think Moses, after God told him, hey Moses, guess what? You ain't going into the promised land for what you just did. You don't think Moses said, I wish I had not opened my big mouth. But these people might be angry. You know what? Some people deserve your anger. There are some people that just get on your nerves and they deserve your anger. And you're probably within your right to give them a piece of your mind. Some of you be careful. You ain't got much left. So you done lost a lot of it. But in giving them a piece of your mind, you could be hurting yourself. Because you think you get angry at the people you most love. Now that's funny because I got mad at myself too big. You used to get angry at the person you most love. Two of you got it. The rest of you, when you get home, you're going to get it. You're slow, but you're worth the way. Don't speak for God unless God told you to say it. You don't, you don't, you, you ain't Moses. If God didn't allow Moses to go put people in their place, what makes you think he's going to allow you? What makes you think he's going to allow me? I'm very careful. Sometimes you guys think I don't hold back. You don't know how much I hold back. I hold back so much, I got another sermon going on in my head right now. I just can't preach that one. That's why I talk really fast sometimes and I make that words. Moses. Chastised the people and then took action that God never intended for him. Do not speak what God didn't say for you to say. If God gives you a word for someone, honor God by just sharing exactly what he said. Many times God has told me, pray for that person. And I know that person's all messed up. If I can ever tell that person, you know what, you're all messed up, so I'm going to pray for you. God said I need to pray for you. You know what, just keep that to you. You know it, okay, yeah. Just pray for it. God's not in the business of destroying people. God's in the build, business of building people. Don't allow your anger to creep into your spiritual life. Because God may get mad. Moses shows, it, shows us that you don't have to be perfect to be used by God. You just need to learn how to serve and obey God while you are flawed, while you have issues. While you're tore up from the floor up is when God wants to use you. You need to release yourself from other people's issues that are holding you back from serving God with all your mind, all your strength, and all your mind. And you need to speak the truth in love. Don't be angry when God is talking to somebody else and he's not saying what you want them to hear. And ask my wife to come and pray this morning as we get ready for baptisms. After the baptisms, if you need me to pray for you, I will be here. I'll be wearing flip-flops, but I can pray for you in flip-flops. Amen? Sister Anna. at our school this, this week, it was a uh, Wednesday, she wanted to hear all of our stories in between all the, the stuff that she had to share with us. Uh, 